Thank you very much, Julian, and also for the privilege of having been invited to give these lectures, and especially with Dr. Mariana here. This is a great privilege. And now, after all that stuff about no PowerPoint and no notes, <laughs> I've forgotten what I'm going to say, but we'll <laughs> <laughs> we will start off. Right, well, I suppose I should begin with the story so far, a brief summary of what I did last time. In the 19th century, and I was keeping going back to the 19th century debate. The conservatives who said that women were appropriately placed in their legal position, and their legal position was in the power of their husbands, roughly speaking, the conservatives who argued for that said it was suited to the natures of the sexes because the sexes were different in every possible respect, from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, to the constitution of their brain and their sinews, and men were stronger in every shape, intellectual, nervous, physical, full of more energy. And they used that to justify the position of women. Now, what I argued in the last lecture was that although they were talking about the characters of the sexes, it was in a sense intuitively reasonable because obviously if you have a female mammal with highly dependent young, that female mammal is going to have a rather different role in life from the male mammal who is assist assisting her. And it looks as though from very early in our species, the males assisted the females in the rearing of offspring. But what we were asking about and what John Stuart Mill very specifically said he was asking about was the laws which framed these two sexes. And he said that they simply put the women in the power of men. And it was the laws he was objecting to, nothing about the natural situation of the sexes. And if you unpick those laws, it looks as though the only kind of coherent justification that can be given for them is that men should be able to keep an eye on the offspring. Men should know whose children are which, and you can't do that if women are on the loose. So at some point in our history, very early on, these external social pressures and laws cemented this inferiority of women and this subjection to the power of men. That was what I was talking about last time. This time I want to go on to this business of how different the sexes are in character because that subject has not gone away and shows not the slightest sign of going away. Now, as I was saying last time, James Fitzjames Stephen, who is our standard conservative for the 19th century. Oh, sorry, just one bit about the story so far, this shifting landscape. The situation is obviously entirely different now from the way it was in the 19th century and even more different from earlier because we've had massive technological changes which have altered the whole pattern of work and also taken an enormous load off the domestic chores, which even a couple of generations ago completely dominated the lives of most women. And also we've had this massive change in reproductive technology, which means that we have contraception that separated sex from procreation. We have DNA testing, which means you can establish paternity without keeping women in chains. And we have had this extraordinary business of IVF and all the rest of them, which mean that we can mix up parentage. And we have the extraordinary problem of how to decide whose children are which, because it isn't just a case of a couple anymore. And in the, case, in the process of giving women more emancipation and recognizing them as equal beings, we've also begun to give children rights as well. And if the more people who have rights, the more complicated it is to decide how to balance them all. There was a great deal to be said for traditional patriarchy in that it kept the women and children in order. 
it meant it was a much less complicated social structure. But we are way beyond that now. Now, the difference in character of the sexes, if there is any. James Fitzjames Stevens said, completely different. Mill, who was a philosopher of science, said, we can't tell how different they were because women have been kept in systematically different environments through the whole of their upbringing. Now, that was the way things were. And Mill was working at a time when the social sciences were just getting underway. People were beginning to think that humanity could be investigated in the same way as other kinds of science. Mill thought that the sexes probably were rather different, but his official position was, we don't know. Now, what happened after that was rather interesting, because we went in, after the First World War, we went into a phase when, for fairly obvious psychological reasons, there was a great resistance to studying humanity in certain ways, especially from a biological point of view, as a response to racism. And in 1973, it was still going on, there was a statement put out, and this was about race, not sex. There was an, I think it was called a manifesto against racism or something. It was an advertisement taken out in the New York Times, signed by a thousand academics from American institutions, stating boldly, all human beings are endowed with equal intelligence and denouncing as pernicious and socially destructive, oh, oh, unscientific and pernicious, socially pernicious, any investigations into these matters. So we were in the middle in the 70s, the six, late 60s and 70s, when feminism was getting going of a general idea that the whole of the differences between people were socially induced and therefore could be blamed on society, not attributed to the fundamental natures of them. This was a very strong position in the social sciences for a long time. But in the meantime, to go back to sex rather than race, we'd also been doing a lot of investigations which were simply not possible in Mill's time. We were finding out about hormones and their effects on character, considerable, but also we had this terrible business of the onset of sociobiology, which turned eventually into evolutionary psychology. And this was horrifying to a lot of feminists and a lot of the left wing in general because it said, it seemed to go even worse than Mill, right back to Stephen. It said the sexes really are radically different because they have been subjected to different selective pressures in the process of evolution. Animals are subjected to different pressures. We know that different species diversify and so on. Women and men are obviously subject to different social pressures, sorry, selective evolutionary pressures, simply because of their reproductive differences. Now, Darwin said that as soon as you start to understand how creatures work, as soon as creatures develop what we might call psychology and emotion and all that sort of thing, the emotions they develop are going to be as relevant to which of them are reproductively successful and leave progeny as any other aspect of them, like the length of their leg or the colour of their fur or anything. And he pointed out, well, <coughs> it has been pointed out since, obviously in a lot of species, males and females are going to be subjected to different social pressures because, especially in mammals, but not only in mammals, the females are going to have to nurture these children a woman breeding flat out can only have one child a year at maximum, on average. Whereas a male who breeds at maximum is going to be able to have an awful lot of children every year if he's good enough at attracting females and keeping other males off. Now this is going to give the sexes different selection pressures. Now, it varies with species. If you're an elephant seal, 
where the female does all the looking after of the offspring. The males have nothing to do except go out and fight each other and get bigger and bigger and more and more fierce and have bloody battles all over the place. Um, our species is obviously not like that. One of the indications of that is our great similarity of size. The elephant seals have huge differential size. So males have obviously had to cooperate with females in our species for most of our history. But still, there is still this difference of opportunity. A female cannot have more than a certain number of children. A male can. So even if he's got to put his resources into bringing up his wife's children, he can always possibly get some more on the side, which may be brought up by the woman on her own, or may be brought up by some other cuckolded male who thinks that the children are his. And this has given, according to evolutionary psychology, radically different pressures for the development of the sexes, and in particular, given them very different kinds of, for instance, for instance, has given them very different kinds of emotions, particularly the emotions of sexual jealousy. Because the idea is that both, both sexes are capable of intense jealousy. But the male's fear, evolutionarily speaking, what produced the emotions he's got, is the fear of cuckoldry, the fear that he will be putting his resources into bringing up another man's child. Whereas the female's fear, according to this kind of theory, is that she will be deserted once she's got the children. She'll be left by the man who goes off and has children with another woman. Now, I want to do more about these, what evolutionary psychology says about the differences in the next lecture, because it becomes quite fun and it might be turned into a... <laughs> well, we'll see how it turns out, the discussion. <laughs> But let me just give you one anecdote, which I found very interesting. It was br my, c my colleagues will have heard it, but some of you won't. Um, which was brought up in a, a British association, uh, yes, a British association meeting where there were um, evolutionary psychologists confronting their opponents. Now, I won't bother about trying to explain the confrontation yet, but there was a woman there who said, um, she was talking about her own experience. She said she'd had a terrible time a few years before when her husband had fallen in love with another woman and she knew that this was the case. She knew the husband and the other woman were involved. She said the real crushing blow came when she discovered that he had been putting bookshelves up in her house. <laughs> now, I told this story in several contexts the men are usually utterly baffled. What do bookshelves matter? The <laughs> women understand immediately. <laughs> and evolutionarily, the woman knows that the resources of her man are being put into another woman's nest. And this is what she... Now, it's quite interesting. And it's quite interesting when you see these... Uh, once, once you start learning what these evolutionary differences are supposed to be, you start catching your own unguarded emotions. And they're very interesting. <laughs> we'll discuss that more later. Now, I found this, to start with scientifically, all very interesting. A lot of people say there's a lot of bad science around in evolutionary psychology, and there may well be. There is in most areas of science as people try to push their pet theories forward. But structurally, it's just what you'd expect. There's a sort of backwards and forwards testing of theories against our current observations and our theories about how we might have evolved. And when they come together, as in any other area of science, we start thinking there's something in it. Um, we can go into that as much as anyone wants, though I'm not an expert, I'm not an up-to-date expert anyway in how these theories are developing. But essentially, I think the useful way to think of it is that evolutionary thinking generates hypotheses about human nature as it is now, which we can then subject to the normal kind of testing. 
And there are all kinds of hypotheses which have been thrown up by thinking from this direction, which simply would not have been thrown up without evolutionary thinking. It isn't that it's logically impossible to get the whole of human nature just by observing people as they are now, but the evolutionary theory gives a different kind of way of looking at it. For instance, I'm not sure how the testing on this one has gone, but one theory thrown up by evolution is that you would have different patterns, not only of sexual jealousy, but of sexual infidelity between men and women. And the, the men would just be unfaithful whenever they got the opportunity, roughly speaking. Well, I mean, this, is, this is just a general tendency. Um, whereas women would not want to unless there was a very high calibre man involved. And one of the things that was investigated, and I think with some success, but I'm not sure how it's gone, is the idea that women would be most women would find different kinds of men attractive depending on where they were in their cycle. And when they were at their most fertile, they would find attractive the, the wolves who went around scattering their seed wherever they could. And when they were in the rest of the cycle, they would look for a nice, reliable husband who could support them. And if so, you can see why men might have wanted to keep women captive. Anyway, enough of that. Now, as I say, there was a hot feminist backlash to all this, and not just feminist. Um, the idea, I've encountered it in several contexts. One is just the sheer atmosphere when I've been talking about some of these things to groups of feminists. You, you, it's, it's extraordinary feeling as though you're a leper. <laughs> but um, it, they vary. I've noticed it more in Cambridge than Oxford. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. Also, I was, uh, Julian told you I was just about to do another edition of um, my, a book on Darwin I wrote some time ago, Darwinian Theory. And I was looking up the reviews on the Amazon websites, <coughs> including the American one, and one of them starts off, disappointed in Janet Radcliffe Richards. She has bought into this terrible reductionist theory and all the rest of it. So, she, I don't think she got far into the book. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, that's what she said. So, <coughs> what can one say about this? <coughs> well, instead of just going straight into this issue as it is, I want to go back to James Fix, James Stephen, and John Stuart Mill. We've now done the shift in the technological environment, both for um, life in general and for reproduction. We've now got a lot of scientific progress, a lot of which is regarded as political anathema. We then have another shift, which is much more subtle and which puzzled me a lot when I first looked at these two. Now, if you remember some of the arguments from last week, John Stuart Mill, James Fitzjames Stevens says, the sexes are totally different. John Stuart Mill, the philosopher of science says, we can't know how different they are because we've never seen them in systematically controlled environments. Now, what's extraordinary about those two? I, I would have said that was a total response to James Fitz, James Stephen from John Stuart Mill. What was extraordinary is that that wasn't the order they came in. James Fitz, James Stephen's book was actually a reply to Mill. So where Mill says we can't know because we haven't got controlled experiments, John, James Fitzgerald Stephen says, obviously different in every respect, men stronger in every shape. Then again, James, John Stuart Mill says, this is the logical point in his arguments, if women by nature can't do all these things that men are supposed to be able to do, there's no point in having rules keeping them out because they won't be able to do it anyway. If they really want to be married under these circumstances and have spend their lives with families and children, then there is no point in having rules to stop them doing anything else and force them into marriage. Again, this strikes me as absolutely conclusive. What does James Fitzjames Stephen say in reply? He says, 
laws and rules ought to clothe society as a man's clothes fit him. And you shouldn't be trying to make people equal when they're not any more than you should try to make ugly feet look handsome by squeezing them into tight boots. Now again, what is this business of clothing society in the way it naturally falls? Surely if it naturally falls into a certain shape, you shouldn't need to clothe it with laws to make it do something different. So how is that meant to be a reply to Mill? Again, Mill says, by putting men and women in the power of men, you tie women to the vilest malefactor who has some wretched woman attached to him. James Fitzgerald Stephen says, well, of course, a man should not be able to beat his wife if he displays him. But, you know, that's a sort of detail. That's ground for separation. Um, and we saw what separation involved last week. Well, now, what exactly is going on? Because one of the important aspects of practical philosophy, these two seem to me to be passing each other like ships in the night. They didn't seem to engage at all. So there must have been some underlying disagreement which simply wasn't reaching the surface. And it's always interesting in practical philosophy to try and find out what these are. I've noticed several recently, for instance, Julian was having an interesting debate recently, which I think had quite a bit of that character from the other side. <laughs> um, so what is it? Now, I couldn't understand it at the time, and it wasn't until I'd finished the work on the implications of Darwinian theory that I began to see what was going on. James Fitzjames Stephen says things like, society has, you, the laws have to fit society as it is. Um, it must conform to the natural state of society. But sometimes society needs a little adjusting to repair its aberrations, its faults. This, he says, having drawn the comparison with tight boots, he says, is like putting a bent leg into irons to straighten it. It's to get it the way it ought to be. He also says things like, after all, the division of labour between men and women is just for the general good of society, for everybody in society, and men and women, he says, can no more have different interests than different parts of the same body. Now, this shows a lot about James Fitzjames Stevens' the underpinnings of the whole way he looked at the world. He thought of the world as an essentially harmonious whole, which could run smoothly as long as aberrant people didn't mess it up by doing the wrong things. <laughs> and he said, for instance, so uh, he, he even conceded implicitly that occasionally a woman might be better at something than her husband. But she said she still got to su be subordinate. She must still let him have his way, just as the first mate of a ship uh, maybe a better seaman than the captain, but still, if you're going to have your ships running properly, you've got to have the first maid taking orders, irrespective of how good they are. And he says that's essentially what the case is in marriage. On the whole, it's much better if men take the lead, and a woman must put up with this, even when occasionally her husband's wrong. She says, he, should, he says, she should go along with what he deliberately decides. <laughs> you can just see this pompous 19th century judge <laughs> deliberately deciding things and other uh, women having to go along with it. Now, it's interesting because they were aware in the 19th century that there was a division between liberals and conservatives in their general approach to how society worked. And the way it was described then was the difference between a kind of mechanistic view of society and an organic view of society. Now, I think the best way to explain this organic view of society is the belief that the world had a moral underpinning in its structure, and we had to go along with that. And in fact, and the, the mechanistic view, on the other hand, thought that the world had to be got into shape by devices, 
done by us. It wasn't that we went along with the world, we should try to make the world conform with the way we thought about, well, that we thought it should be. And this, of course, was part of the difference between the utilitarians and their opponents. The utilitarians didn't think the world was naturally good. They thought we had to put in structures to make it better. Um, now, it's interesting that we have a very deep background culturally about a world which has an underlying moral order and which only goes wrong when people do things they shouldn't. For instance, the Judaic tradition God didn't actually create the world, he put it into order. But the earth was, earth was without form and void. And God came in and started separating things into definable shapes. And then God s gave a whole lot of rules about what you should do within this world. And if you didn't do it, you got into trouble with fire and brimstone and being thrown out of the Garden of Eden and all the rest of it. It's our fault. The world was essentially good. God saw that it was good and we mucked it up. Um, our forebears did and we've stuck with original sin ever since. Um, then there was also the Greek tradition and this was very different but it also had a moral order and here I'm going to bungle into uh, rotten scholarship about Aristotle et al, but never mind, I'm just trying to s make a suggestion about how we think still. If you think about the Aristotelian universe, which got incorporated in Christianity rather une uneasily because it doesn't fit the Judaic idea, you, you will remember from early history of astronomy the idea that the earth was at the centre and things went round it. First we had the moon and then the planets and then the fixed stars. And finally, above it all, there was God, who for Aristotle was pure reason, not like the Judaic God at all. Um, but the interesting thing about the... People say that Copernicus messed things up by taking the Earth out of its central position and making us less important because the earth was out of its central position. But there was no idea that the, the traditional view, especially if you see it in Dante, for instance, is not that there's anything good about being in the centre. Being in the centre is the very worst place, the lowest circle of hell. And you get better and better, roughly speaking, as you go up. And Christianity, interestingly, filled in the gap between humans who were quite a long way up the great chain of being and God right at the top with nine orders of angels. I've never yet found a medievalist who can tell me whether the nine orders of angels were just an intellectual filling in of the great chain of being, but they looked to me as though they probably were. Now, if you have a belief in a world which has a natural order, it will make you think about how to understand that world in a particular way. And I think essentially, this is what James Fitzjames Stephen was doing. Now, it certainly happened with the explicitly religious people, but a lot of the people in the 19th century were religious even though they didn't bring it into their political arguments. And I think James Fitzjames Stephen's idea was essentially we know just intuitively in the nature of things that men and women ought by nature to occupy a particular position. We know that this must be harm this must be conducive to harmony and a good thing, because the world was divinely created and morally structured. Therefore, it follows that the sexes must have been constructed to fit harmoniously into this way. It's a perfectly recognisable bit of reasoning of a scientific structure. You know some bits and you fit in the others. And I think this is essentially what was going on. Now, I'm going to come back to that later and in, in the last lecture. But for now, let me just contrast this with what happened later when Darwin came along because there had been lots of ideas of evolution before Darwin. Um, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, 
was an evolution is because they were beginning to find out from geology that there had been in the older layers of rock these primitive organisms and they gradually got more and more complicated. So evolution looked plausible, but nobody could think of a mechanism by which it worked scientifically. And they were thinking essentially of evolution as progression up the great chain of being from inanimate through plants, through other animals, through us, and then possibly through angels. I'm not sure how they, exactly how they worked that. But they were essentially thinking of evolution that way. Then along came Darwin and produced a mechanism by which evolution could work. But in doing so, he completely removed this idea of evolution up the moral progress that was thought of in the original great chain of being. You didn't get more and more morally perfect as you went up. You simply had better luck in breeding. Some of it was obviously the intrinsic characteristics of the organism, but a lot of it also was the environment. If the dinosaurs hadn't been hit by meteors, meteorite, we wouldn't have been here, I think. That is true to say. So Darwin produced a mechanism, natural selection, by which, <coughs> by which evolution could be explained, but it turned evolution into a totally different kind of thing, which wasn't the intuitive progression up the great chain of being. Or rather, if, even if it was to some extent, it always had to be simplicity to complexity, though it could always be the other, also be the other way around, but you couldn't start with complexity. It had nothing to do with the moral standing of the creatures who evolved. And after all, it's not so many years since we were all frightened of a nuclear winter in which the human race would be exterminated and what would be left would be cockroaches. Those would be the successful things in the Darwinian competition then. Nothing like great chain of being. Now the trouble with Darwin, the trouble with post-Darwinian stuff, is that a great many people have taken on board a lot of the subsequent scientific work that has followed from Darwinian theory and then neo-Darwinism with genes. But they haven't noticed that it doesn't have any of the implications which understanding the nature of things used to have. The clearest illustration of this is social Darwinism. The idea that you would improve society by letting the Darwinian unfit go to the wall and die out. There's nothing in Darwinism which says that it's the good people who are going to survive at all. It might be the, uh, the, the love rats and uh, all those. Um, so that was one misunderstanding. But I think also some of the other misunderstandings come in what it is to understand the nature of something. Because when you get a Darwinian world, to understand the nature of something is not to understand how it ought to be, it is just to understand how it works, not to say anything about how it ought to work. If you understand in ordinary scientific terms the nature of iron or gold, you're not saying anything about how this lump of stuff ought to be. You're saying, if you do this to it, this will happen. If you do this, that will happen. That's what it is to understand how something works. And in that way, to understand the difference of the nature of men and women is to understand not how they ought to function as a man, what a true man is or a true woman is, it's just looking at the individuals and saying, I'm sorry, the Darwinian, the Darwinian idea that, the neo-Darwinian idea that the sexes are likely to be very different, just says if you take the average of these people, you'll find there's a strong tendency to difference, which is what we would expect because of the different selective pressures the sexes were under. But it's nothing to do with saying all women are essentially the same there may be aberrations at the outside, but we should push them into being the same. 
all it is is a description of a kind of tendency you'd expect. You wouldn't expect them to be the same because the whole way, basis on which Darwinian evolution works is a matter of um, variation and the same with men. You aren't saying anything at all about where they ought to be, what a proper one is. You're not saying that there is some essence of them. And again, a lot of critics of evolutionary psychology say that it's going back into essentialism, forcing men, women and men into these separate categories. It's doing nothing of the sort. It's simply giving a description of the kinds of difference you could expect to find. And those are things which... Um, don't have any obvious political implications. Now, I suspect that a lot of the opposition to these theories, I'm, I'm not suggesting that everything that is put out in the name of these theories is good. All I'm saying is that there's nothing wrong scientifically, there's everything good scientifically, from <coughs> combining these different kinds of approach to the study of human nature. And we should not be at all surprised. In fact, we should expect that there will be strong tendencies to difference between the sexes. Um, now, I think that the traditional ordered universe view the idea that the universe itself contains a moral structure along with its empirical structure is very deep in our psychology. It's certainly, I suspect, I, I think this is probably true and I throw it out as a hypothesis, the main difference between religious views of the world and non-religious, and they're not necessarily about a traditional monotheistic god, the, the religions that don't have that kind of God, like Buddhism, still have a moral order and a way through to escape the harm in the, in, in the natural world. I think the difference between a religious and non-religious view is this belief in a moral order. And if you believe that there is a moral order built into the structure of the world, you may also believe that it's clear how we should behave and if we behave in a certain <coughs> way, then we will have a certain kind of good outcome. This is the essence, I think, though again I may be corrected by better scholars, of Aristotelian virtue theory. The idea is that the world is a harmonious whole which can be disrupted in various ways if you don't act in a virtuous way. Virtuous way makes you flourish as an individual, but I think the implication is also that everything else flourishes too. And the trouble with Darwinian theory is that your flourishing as an individual is certainly not a matter of everything else is flourishing too. It may be a matter of your immediate society flourishing too, but it may not, and this is totally different way of looking at it. Now, there is another aspect to all this as well. In fact, I'm condensing this all so much that I'm going to make it too short. I thought it was going to be too long, and I've been um, condensing it. Um, one of the interesting things that's come out of recent scientific research, psychological research, is this is not evolutionary stuff. This is just ordinary psychological research. I recently read um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which sums up a lot years and years of research. How, understandably, we have terrible intuitions, intellectual intuitions. Our immediate responses to things are ones that we can show are entirely incompatible with careful reasoning. And Kahneman, this, this shows how the science with evolution goes backwards and forwards. He hasn't started with an evolutionary theory and come out with this. He's done direct, direct observations and he keeps thinking, interestingly, of plausible evolutionary theories. 
why this might have come about. But it is interesting when you look at these experiments to find how absurdly we reason at an intuitive level. And then we have a similar kind of work done about moral psychology by people like Jonathan Haidt, who point out, and this again was something I said Mill had anticipated 150 years earlier, that, when our mo that we have very, very strong moral intuitions and that when they're challenged, we don't think of giving them up. We think of finding ways to defend them almost so quickly that we can't even see what we're doing. Um, now, if it's the case, and I don't know what the state of evolutionary argument here is, if it's the case that as a social species, we have had to develop a very strong conscience, the idea is, the, the idea of this moral um, underpinning seems to be in height, and I think this is probably right, that we are capable of a species, as a species, of internalizing not only our own interests, which we then try to act on, but we're capable of absorbing moral views, where a moral view should be understood as one which we are willing to act on, even at cost to ourselves, and even against our own interests. And not simply that we're willing to do this, but we're willing to put resources into imposing it on other people. Now, when you think of morality in that kind of way, it becomes very like an informal law. The penalties are not going to be ones laid down in law, but what it amounts to is the whole of a society, however big you want to say the society is, getting together and putting resources into controlling people who are behaving in ways that you think they shouldn't. And if you have a strong conscience, you will put these resources into controlling yourself as well and making yourself go along with these moral views. Now, people obviously vary a lot in how deep their consciences are. Some will never do what they think is wrong, which they're convinced is wrong. Some people will only act according to what they think is right when other people are watching. Other people will just get away with doing what they recognise as being wrong, whatever the other people are doing. There's also considerable variation obviously, in people's moral standards between different societies. Again, I don't know how variable these are. It's said that there are common ones underlying all societies, and I don't know what the <coughs> state of research there is. But if we have got this strong inclination to moral views, and we get fixed on certain things being the right thing to do, then when we start rationalising, we very quickly start mangling the logic and ignoring the, the empirical evidence and inventing things. And I think looking back at James Fitzjames Stephen and John Stuart Mill, we can see something like that going on. James Fitzjames Stephen was absolutely, seriously, genuinely convinced that morally, women ought to be subordinate to men. He hadn't gone back into thinking the logic through the logic of why the differentiating structures should take the form they did, but he clearly was absolutely convinced that this was the case. And he presumed that the right action would produce the right kind of outcome. Therefore, he believed that the world was constructed in such a way as to make these things fit together. In other words, he was adjusting the belief about the natures of men and women rather against everybody's observation because nobody really thought, even in the 19th century, that all women were <coughs> passive and useless and all men wanted competent wives. They just wanted the competent wives to focus their efforts on the interests of the men. I think a lot of the current 
left-wing ideology of, of both the general left and the feminist left is somehow, this is an empirical hypothesis and it may be wrong, but it seems to me that it's somehow still caught up in a lot of these ideas of a morally ordered universe, which in theory it doesn't accept. It shows in all kinds of contexts. It shows, for instance, <coughs> in a lot of the deep green climatology debate. The idea is that we have upset the balance of nature and it's We've got, to, we've got to reform ourselves to put it right. It's an interesting aspect of the debate between the geoengineering approach to climate and the idea that we should all stop being so wasteful with resources and live in a much simpler way. There are obviously a lot of empirical questions there about whether geoengineering would work and whether refraining from producing carbon would work. But quite apart from those, I am sure there is in the depth of we have upset the balance of nature, an idea that we have done something wrong which has upset what should be the case and that we ought to reform our moral selves rather than, um, rather than start messing around even more with the structure of the world. Incidentally, that whole business of messing around interfering is a kind of vocabulary you wouldn't even use unless you thought there was a moral structure to be interfered with. Now, we the, once you start looking for this, there are examples of it all over the place, and they're certainly not just on the left. We had a lovely example of it in the American elections, not the presidential, but you remember that Senate candidate who got into trouble about rape he talked about legitimate rape to start with, but he obviously meant proper rape, you know, not sort of half consensual. Abortion's wrong, he thought. Rape is wrong. So he filled in the empirical bit in the middle. Well, obviously, if you shouldn't do abortions and rape is wrong, it must be the case that you can't conceive if it's really rape. That gives you conveniently both ends of your, you fit the empirical stuff in with the, to make sense of the ethics. And I suspect there's a huge amount of that still in our psychology. And it also fits the moral psychologist's observations that some of the things we are most committed to are <coughs> the moral, the immediate moral ideas. So, for instance, if you are committed to the immediate moral idea that women and men ought to be equally represented in different parts of society and that this would be best for society as a whole, then you may start filling in the middle bit with the idea that men and women are essentially the same and therefore be resistant to any idea that Perhaps the ideal society is not one where men and women equally share things. Now, that was an enormously compressed scamper through stuff. But the essence of it is that, talking about this shifting landscape, there's been a metaphysical shift as well. The metaphysical shift came in the Enlightenment when people started thinking that the whole world could be understood in principle in scientific terms. Hume said that he couldn't understand. He said he was surprised to find that people deduced an ought from an is. Now, there are various levels at which you can take that. But at the simplest level, he shouldn't have been surprised because he was coming out of a world where people presumed there was a moral structure where you could sort of deduce the ought from the is. He was moving into a different structure where everything was, where the moral and the physical were completely independent of each other. I think we are still very deeply rooted intuitively in the idea of a morally ordered world, even though a lot of us have intellectually rejected it. And rather to my surprise, some of the most deeply rooted in 
are the ideologues in feminism and left-wingery in general. And if that isn't enough to cause controversy, <coughs> I don't know what is. <coughs> so I'll stop. Let me just...